Hey everyone, today's uh, recording is going to be a bit chaotic and I I apologize beforehand because um, I know that these things require uh, your attention span and I know that, that uh, you guys usually can't really watch something or listen to something that's longer than maybe 10-15 minutes so I apologize beforehand but I'm going to have to make an exception for this one. The best thing to do is to you know, in case something happens, that I make a recording where I tell you guys everything that I can remember, and hopefully in the right order as well, uh, about what happened. Because you guys know that I have waited. I've waited with telling you guys about my story. And I've already explained why, and it's because of, you know, this thing that I have where I... Because of all the trauma I went through, I have forgotten a lot of the things that happened to me. So my memory has all these glitches in it, um, and therefore I have waited with the story, with the actual story, until I have recovered a whole lot more mentally, so that I can tell it in a better way. But now I'm seeing that all these things are happening, so I thought, you know what, maybe I shouldn't wait. Maybe I should just say it as I know it, of, as I know of it now. And eventually, as I get better, as I rec- uh, recover more and more, I will tell it in a better way. So I think that would be a better solution. So what was it that Nina follows Christ? What was it that she went through? Why is she on YouTube? Why is she making videos about that she's no longer Muslim and that she's Christian? The thing is, my family, the way I was raised, is that I was raised in a way where where if you look around you, wherever you live in the Western world, and you see these good Muslims, right? You see these Muslims who are integrated, they're highly educated, they're just like everyone else. My family was like that. We were among those Muslims that if you were to get to know us just for an hour or two, even less, you would think to yourself, well, there is nothing wrong with Muslims because these people are perfect examples of good Muslims, right? So we were that family. We we gave Islam a good reputation because we were good people. We had good character. We behaved well in society. And really, we made sure there was no distinction between us and non-Muslims. Because that's what we believed. We believe that Islam is the same thing as everything else that's good. That Islam is not about all this violence that we speak of. And so, of course, therefore, the Muslims who are true Muslims must be great people, right? That's how we grew up. That's all that we knew. Why did we know this? Because we had a general understanding of Islam. We had studied the Quran, we had studied the Hadiths very briefly, and we hadn't done any comparative studies with the actual Judeo-Christian scriptures, but we had uh, done this overall studying of, well, what is Islam, right? And our usually our sources of information were Muslim books, and the people that we usually t- studied with were Muslim. So in many ways it was bias, and if something is bias and you study it, uh, like that, you're usually not going to get um, in an, an objective, well-rounded understanding of what it is based on actual facts about this religion. It's rather going to be a comfort fest, if you know what I mean. So this is how we grew up, all of us. Um, every single Muslim family amongst my relatives had this similar understanding. We were all different in the sense that we had different ways that we practiced Islam. Some people were more devout uh, devout uh, to their prayers, to their fasting and whatnot. Some people were more uh, loyal to the ways of the Hadith, the different rules of the Hadith. Some were just Quran-only Muslims. And in my family, we were somewhere in between, you know, Hadith-abiding Muslims, but also Quran-only Muslims. We had a variety there in our household. And if you guys have heard my previous videos, you've seen that, uh, well, if you've watched them, you've seen that I've already explained that I had um, I had this phase where I became a, a Quranist, and, and there were other people in my family who also had that phase, because we started at a certain age, in our 20s, we started to really uh, question um, why? Why was it that there were some things in the hadiths that were not okay? Um, and our only conclusion was that, well, there are some hadiths that have been falsified, uh, and also you cannot rely on the hadiths because, because um, you know, these are texts that have been uh, written not uh, in a way where 
there was somebody who who was there with the Prophet Muhammad and took notes, but rather that it was somebody who heard someone who heard someone who heard some it was it was like that you know what i mean like a hearsay thing and and so we thought hey therefore it cannot be the word of god Pro- probably some of it is true or inspired by true things and some of those things we're going to assume is the way you do your prayer and whatnot because we thought hey these things have been carried down generations upon generations right so it can't possibly be wrong but then the rules about rape about you know violence and all that you know either it was that these rules were restricted for that age in time maybe for a specific war and not for today that that is how we were supposed to interpret it or these uh, violent verses were um, falsified. They were not true of, um, sources of actual uh, hadith. They were not something you could rely on. So in that way, we picked and choose, you know, what was right, what was wrong, and and basically made sense of Islam. That's what we did. And in the end, what happened was that we would just become more of Quran-only Muslims. So although we took elements from the hadiths, that we practice Islam with, we still were more of Quran-only Muslims. We were not the, the literal kind of Muslims that do everything by the book, but rather we applied our own understanding of what everything meant. And usually, um, you know, it, it, it just became this thing where Islam was just... It fit our own worldview, it fit our own understanding of things, it fit our own ideologies. Um, that is my understanding of it. That's what my family was like, that's what we were like. And that's why we also were Muslims for so long. Why all of them are still Muslims. And why I am the only one who, at least what I know of, uh, officially left Islam and made a a big deal out of it. So, we were... I'm explaining this to you guys so you would understand two things. We We were the good kind of Muslims who people usually, when they see them, think that there's nothing wrong with Islam. And... Um, we did not really know Islam the way people like, for example, David Wood knows it, you know, all these uh, s- people who, who, who you can see all over the internet who've actually studied the facts and the evidence for everything um, in, in these, uh, not only in Islam, but also Christianity, Judaism, and, and can compare and contrast. And I've also looked at the evidence outside of religion and from that drawn a conclusion of what Islam really is, right? Um, We we did not have that kind of objective understanding of it. Therefore, there was no talk about, hey, why was Muhammad the prophet? um, Why was he, you know, marrying this little girl? But rather, there was conversations like, you know, this little girl um, that he married, she was not that young. It was a mistake in the texts. She was not... uh, She was not a little child. She was actually uh, a young adult. There was a mistake with the numbers. You know, there were things like that, okay? This is the background I come from. So it's not strange at all that I left Islam that late. It's not strange at all that that uh, many of these Muslims remain Muslims, okay? I want you guys to understand that. The good kind of Muslims are the ones who have most difficulty seeing what's wrong with Islam. It's the Muslims who live in ex- in, in these countries where Islam is practiced by the book that tend to have a problem with Islam. People like those who live in Iran, those who live in Saudi Arabia, who can't drive alone, who can't, they can't drive, I mean, they can't also walk around in the streets alone without uh, a male escort. These are the people who usually tend to see problems with Islam. But everybody in the West, you know, we're all living a happy life. We're, we've, we've all integrated into the Western society. Everything is great, right? Everything's fine. What is it to worry about? Until one person or two, or whatever, how many how many people you want to think of. Um, in the West, all of a sudden, somebody like me, you know, uh, would all of a sudden go through this, this phase in life, maybe a difficulty, maybe a trial of some sort, and that that trial would trigger that person the way it triggered me to start questioning Islam, all right? That's why I left Islam. Something happened in my personal life that gave me the motivation and the reason to, to dive into uh, Islamic, uh, you know, questioning, questioning Islam uh, in, in, a, in a more, in the same approach that I would question anything else. 
And that's why I also found eventually that Islam is false in the sense that the claims that it makes about that it's the religion of God and all that stuff, it's false. It's false. And besides that Islam is false, I also found that Islam is violent. Islam is uh, all this stuff that it's, people are accusing it of. You know, those people that we always call Islamophobes or racists and whatnot, these people actually know what Islam is. And 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 the funny thing is, Muslims, when, when, when we hear that these accusations we immediately tend to revert back to some kind of defense state i've already explained this before and we deny it we deny it before actually having looked it up and and our immediate response is look the western world is trying to portray islam as something bad because right now that is uh going it's running parallel with their agendas and their agendas is based on money so it's always this explanation money is in power um Islam is just another scapegoat for whatever it is they're trying to do. That's why you have the media attacking Islam. No, I don't care what agenda we're going to talk about here. I don't care about who is trying to bring Islam to where. I don't care if, if, if this thing about the immigrants where so many people came and immigrated into the West at the same time, if it was planned or not, if it was done on purpose or not. My question to Muslims is, have you really studied your faith in terms of what evidence it is based upon? In terms of checking if it really is of God? Have you done that? If you haven't done that, then you cannot possibly know if it actually is as violent as people claim for it to be. And if it, you find out, think about it like this, theoretically, if you as a Muslim find out the way I did, if you find out that Islam is violent, right? Does it matter how it's used? We know that how the world, you know, a lot of people are, are awake nowadays. They know that the world is not what it looks like. And there are many scapegoats that have been used to further push the agenda. I do believe so. I do think that, that um, you know, groups like ISIS and whatnot were funded. I do think these things happen. However, it does not explain. Okay, let's stop there for a second. Does It does not explain how these people who commit such atrocious um, things, okay, how they are able to defend their actions with Islam. That you cannot explain, okay? Why is it that they can do these evil things and have an excuse for it, and their excuse tend to be Islam? Why is it that... I, I know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say... I'm not gonna uh, say that, oh, because they're yelling Allahu Akbar, that therefore it is Islam. No, no, no. That is a, a very big assumption to make. I mean, who knows? Maybe people want Islam to look bad, right? That's not the problem. The problem is their deeds. Their deeds, you can find Islam as a whole, as a whole I entire ideology. It defends these deeds. It commands all of these deeds. They are scriptures of it. There are quotes from the Quran, there are quotes from the Hadith. That is the problem. When you realize this, you understand that Islam, I don't care how it's used for these, you know, elites to do what they want to do with this world. I don't care how it's used. I care about what, I, the same way I would care about anything else that's false. About anything else that's not just false. I mean, people, so a lot of people accept false ideologies, right? A lot of there are if you are a Christian for example you believe that many ideologies are false and that Christianity is true but not all of these ideologies are violent ones so the problem here is not whether or not it's false I mean for me that was a problem because I believed in Islam okay but for people who are not Muslim the problem is not so much if it's false okay the problem is is what it actually is that it is violent that that the ideology is a problem do you understand? The ideology is the issue here. I don't hate Muslims. I don't have a problem with Muslims. Because I know, because I come from that background, that majority of them are peaceful people. Majority of them in the West, I'm talking, uh, are people who came here, they wanted to do something with their lives, they're doing great, and all that. I know the problem is not Muslims. If you want to deal with Islam, if you want to bring up uh, the problems related to Islam, the problem is not Muslims. The problem is Islam. It's the ideology. It is twisted. If you were to compare it with, I mean, think about it. There are people in this world who commit awful crimes. 
and we label them as pedophiles, we label them as murderers, right? And we throw them in jail. Why is it not the same case with Islam? Why is it that we cannot look at Islam and make the same evaluation for the ideology that it is and understand that people who follow it by the, by the very words of it, by the book, who, do, who follow it literally, these people are equivalent to these criminals. That's the understanding that I have. That is, that is what I have been trying to explain on my channel. Now, why is it that Muslims who follow my, my channel, Muslims who, who are against, who, who disagree with what I say, right? Why is it that they call me fake and all that stuff? Well, it's very easy, very, very simple. They, had, they don't have that understanding of Islam that I do. So therefore, they think that because my understanding is different, I never was Muslim to begin with. And I couldn't possibly be right about Islam. Instead of actually questioning what I have to say, that is the conclusion they draw. And on top of that, because I have not given them uh, this you know, pile of evidence to every claim that I've made about my past, about my history, because they, they don't see, you know, me throwing out uh, all this evidence upon evidence upon evidence, well, then I must be fake. But then I ask them, you don't, you, you're not throwing out evidence upon evidence when you tell people about your story. You don't do that stuff, yet you expect uh, them to find you credible. The problem is not that, think about it, we are, as human beings, when we tell people things, we walk around and, and we get to know people and we tell them stuff, do we walk around with a pile of evidence to everything that we talk about? No. No, it's the person who hears you, it's their responsibility to look up what you are claiming. That is the whole point with this channel. It's that I'm saying things and I hope that they, because this is about their ideology, if they care about it so much, if they truly are 100% convinced that what they believe is right, they should be, if they are concerned, they should be looking up what I have to say, rather than stamp, like put, put this label on me immediately and say she's fake. So I'm not concerned with proving these oppressor, um, oppressors or, or those who, my, my opponents, I'm not concerned with proving them that I am speaking truth, because I've already been uh, I, I'm, I already have Muslims and ex-Muslims who believe me and that for me is enough because they will spread the word and the fact that the Christians uh, who, who know Islam in my opinion a whole lot better than Muslims actually do because had I believe had Muslims known Islam they would not have been Muslims they would have actually left it um, so I see a lot of Christians who do know what I'm talking about they have seen the evidence for it and they themselves are going to use what I have said to further, um, you know, conversate with Muslims in a better way and come up with better things to say to them to, to help change their minds. So in that sense, I am making a change, although it is not a huge, you know, world changing thing. I don't care. For me, the only thing that matters is that if there are a few couple of people who are doing this, it's going to start a ripple effect that for me is the change and I'm happy with that. So I'm not so much concerned with answering to these opponents who, who claim that I'm fake. I'm not so concerned about them right now. They're not my area of change. My area of change is those who are in contact with Muslims who are like me and also those who have lived what I've lived and who can relate to me 100%. These are my people that I focus on. And as I've said before, I'll say it again, I do not hate Muslims. I love Muslims, my family were Muslim, I love them to this day, although they treated me so badly, I mean, let's not even begin with that. Um, I love them, I do, and I have forgiven them and I have prayed for them. I love my, my relatives. I love people, even if they're Muslim, do you understand? It's not about, oh, they're Muslim, they're not Muslim. No, it's not Muslims, it's Islam that I have a problem with. The same way that many ex-Muslims have a problem with Islam when they leave it because they lived it because they lived the lies so they are furious with their ideology they want everyone to know about how they've been tricked they want to save as many Muslims as they can from such lies that is why I do what I do it's not that I hate Muslims because to this day I have not 
spoken any kind of hatred towards any Muslim. I have not in any way shown that I am against them. I am not against them. Of course, there are Muslims who are dangerous, who should be considered criminals. These are people who I believe follow the religious book uh, literally. These people I am worried about. These people I am uh, af- in a way afraid of because they're dangerous. And, and that's a whole different story, but I, I don't hate them either. I don't hate people for no reason. I have a problem with ideologies. That is my problem. And if any person would attack me, I would, of course, defend myself. I would use self-defense. Of course, I would protect myself. That, is, that does not uh, equal racism, uh, fascism, whatever you want to put in there to make me seem bad. No. Um, and, and it definitely is not equal to that if you are against Islam as an ideology. So I hope you guys can get that uh, cleared out. Now, I want to quickly explain what happened to me. Why did I flee? Why did I cut contact and all that stuff, right? So, it's very simple. I grew up with a lot of dif- difficulties. I've already explained this. Mentally, I had a lot of things that I struggled with. I had a lot of um, social phobias, fears, all kinds of things. And I also had a lot of spiritual battles from an early age. I experienced a lot of demonic attacks, in my opinion. I, I you know, the way I have lived it, I am... Uh, I believe that they were demonic attacks, they were, you know, attacks of the spirit spirit world, and they kept me under bondage, they kept me under fear, under a lot of things uh, mentally, so that I, I grew up with a weak mentality, and the way I was raised was uh, I, I grew up with, you know, older brothers and, and a family that were very um, protective of me, they took care of me ver- very well, but at the same time, they they um, were very overprotective in the sense that everything that I did, they were involved in, uh, and everything that I, you know, when I had a problem, for example, they solved it for me. Um, when I had any kind of conflict in life, or I had to make a decision for myself, they were in there helping me out. And although they themselves might have felt that they shouldn't have done such things. Maybe they were worried that I would become dependent on them. They did these things. And the way I look at it from what I know of them today is that, you know, these are, these were people who were, my family were, were very much control freaks. They were, they needed to have control over everything. And a way to have control over someone is that you govern their lives. You govern their lives by, uh, through emotional control, psychological control you make them think that they cannot op- operate they cannot function on their own they need constantly need the family family knows best you know you should always consult with the family you should never do anything on your own if it's not through the family if it's not um you know have they approved of it if they haven't most likely it's not right most likely you are going down a very very bad path there was always the scare tactic stuff where you know if you did something risky Everything was going to fall apart. Your whole life was going to turn to a disaster. All of these catastrophic thinkings, accusations, and what, whatever. These things. It, it was a. It was a, in, the way I look at it is, is there, there was emotional and there was psychological abuse in the milder forms, where they were slowly but surely, as you grow grew up, um, planting themselves in you, so that you would you would not be able to identify yourself as a person without. Um, thinking of yourself as being equal to the whole group, you were you were just inseparable in that sense, in a in a in a very unhealthy way where you were fully dependent on them in every matter, and even if you knew it was wrong, even if you had a sense that it was wrong, I mean, you would assume that there's something wrong with you, and even if you you know noticed that some of the things they did was harmful to you. You would always explain it away with things of the kind, you know, the guilt trip kind of stuff where, oh, they went through a lot of things for us, you know, they've they've been through a lot, everything they've done to get us to where we are today, all that stuff to kind of um, put it in a different perspective and get rid of it. So in many ways, although we were a good family, we were um, like everyone else and we were hardworking and everyone were highly educated and whatever, whatever, uh, these people... Even if they did good things, they did charity and all that stuff. 
they were good to other people, um, they were well spoken of, whatever, all these things you can think of that's fantastic in this world. Within our family, within our household, and this was not just my family, where I'm talking about, you know, many of, of the families that I knew within our, our circles, um, amongst my relatives and whatnot. We had these problems. There was these kinds of abuse. But because everybody was doing it, and it was a common thing in that culture, we assumed that that was culture. We assumed that that was okay. We assume that, hey, this is not really abuse, you know, it's just, it's, there's a misunderstanding or we are just um, have, experiencing a cultural clash. However, it's a basic human function to understand when you are being hurt, when somebody is hurting you. And the way a person hurts you is that when they do something repeatedly and it makes you feel smaller, less capable to live your own life, 100% dependent on them when it makes you into this person where you are weak-minded and and you cannot make a decision for yourself you are constantly ambivalent you're you are just this um, your mind is just one big mess it just constantly runs and in 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 all kinds of, of directions and you need somebody to direct you and you know if this is the kind of person you grow up to become you've not grown up in a healthy manner, okay? Most people are supposed to grow up to be prepared for adult life. And adult life means that you are prepared to be separated mentally, emotionally, <clears throat> physically from your family in a way so that you can function on your own, so that you can live a life of your own, you can make your own decisions, you can have your own ideologies that you have formed, that you have set for yourself, and that, that there should not be any social grand consequence of this. There shouldn't be people punishing you for it. There shouldn't be people um, bringing you down for it, making you feel small, helpless, um, ridiculing you, belittling you, um, bullying you. There shouldn't be these elements in there if it's a healthy way to be raised. Now, I was raised in that way. I, I grew up be becoming a bird in a cage. I didn't have a sense of, of independence. And I thought my life was perfect because I did everything by the book. The book meant by Islam and by, you know, um, the culture and my family. Everyone was happy with what I was doing. Then I went through some phase in, in, in high school where, where I started rebelling against these ways, against these ideologies and whatnot. I started trying to form my own way of life. And there was, I, I was immediately met by a huge resistance. Uh, and the, the reason was because I told them. I told them about the things I had done. I told them about the way I wanted to live life. And they, you know, the more information people like this have, the more they can control you, the more they can manipulate you. And so the manipulation began and the, you know, trying to get me out of that kind of life thing began, although I wasn't taking drugs, I wasn't doing any alcohol, I wasn't harming myself in any way. Um, I was just going through a phase where I wanted to discover who I was, right? This uh, was uh, stopped. It was, I, we had a huge family intervention one day. I remember I was in a relationship with someone, uh, a partner I had chosen. They were not, they were against it. They were uh, not accepting of him. He was not Muslim and he was not from our home country. Um, and they were trying for, for many months to get me out of that kind of lifestyle uh, that I had chosen. And one day I remember around summertime when I was 18 years old, they sat me down, they sent a spokesperson from my family, they sat me down and they said, look, you have to choose. Uh, you have to choose between us or, them, or, or him. Um, and you don't have to make that decision right now. You're not at all, no. You, you, you have to make that decision at some point in time because if you continue with this person, most likely you're gonna marry him. And when you marry him, you're gonna have to, um, you know, you're not gonna have the support of your family financially and, and all that. We're not going to be there for you because you're going to go against our wishes. So if you're going to go against our wishes, you know, how are we going to support you? How are we going to want to be part of this, right? So it's going to be difficult for you to, to build a life with this guy because we're not going to be part of it. So, but you make your decision for you, right? You take your time. Of course, immediately when I heard this, I thought I have to leave this person. So I picked up the phone. I called him. I said, you know what? No more. Let's end this relationship right now. Hung up the phone, didn't matter how hurt or, or sad he, he was after that. 
I didn't care because I went to the I went back to them to my family they were all gathered in one place and they welcomed me with hugs and and kisses and and they my brothers gave me a you know pat on the back they were like good job you know you you we knew you would make the right decision for you all right so this is the kind of start I had in my life when it came to rebelling against the ideologies that we had now what's interesting about this is I noticed at that point that I get a whole lot more reward giving up the ways that I want to live life and living it the way they want me to live it. So I started embracing their values. I started being very much pro what they stood for and what they did and being very much anti the way I had uh, enjoyed living life, the way I, the things that I had found to be more, you know, true to me, to who I was. So I started being very much against it. This kept on going for maybe five, six years. Uh, I noticed that I was gaining my respect back because previously when I had lived that other kind of life, the rebellious kind of life, I had lost all kinds of respect. You know, they, they, they looked at me differently. I mean, there were moments we had dinner, my dad wouldn't even look at me. Stuff like that happened. Um, and, and then this sort of, um, you know, it changed suddenly. When I left this person, all of a sudden I got the respect back. I got my honor back. My position went right back where it was. I was loved the same way again. They were accepted. I was given the same kind of, you know, attention and gifts and all that stuff that I was given before. Everything was back to normal, all right? My place in that system was back to normal. So I thought, hey, this is something I should continue with. This is the way I need to live life. If I ever want their love and acceptance, I need to make sure that I don't do anything against their will. That was my attitude. What happened? Very simple. Um, I became like them. So I started talking like them. I started doing things the way they did. Uh, I took on the abusive uh, ways that they t that they had embraced. Um, and here's the thing though, my siblings, they were all just like me. Imagine, we were all siblings. So they, they, they also had conflicts going on, but they were more devoted to this kind of stuff. They had a whole lot more to lose, maybe, who knows. But the, the, this is, there's a lot you can say about that, but, but understand that they were all, we were all in the same pl place. We were all in the same boat. It's just that we took different approaches. I was the one who, who would rebel a whole lot more. I, I, I would you know take a firm stand and say I don't want to do this you know and that was a huge problem in the family especially when you're a girl you know then then you could who knows you could become a slut you could become a drug addict a man might marry you who they don't like and then he steals you away from them stuff like that thoughts like that that they this these cultures tend to have so so what happened was that I I entered another phase when I was in my mid-twenties, you know, big, somewhere in, in the beginning of my twenties to my mid-twenties. I had another phase. My, my school work did not go very well. I was in university. I was failing exams after exams because I was not, I believe, uh, looking back at it, I was not mentally ready for that kind of responsibilities. For I was not ready mentally to, to think independently, to know what I wanted in life, to know why I was doing that education, to, to be mature enough to take this seriously. And it just, you know, when you are in that mental place, school becomes a, uh, it becomes a play zone for you. You're just there for your friends. You're there to look good. You're there to do all this stuff. So that's the kind of person I became when I started university. And, uh, I didn't take my studies very seriously. I studied last minute. And um, what happened was that after the exams piled up, I, I came to a point where I had maybe four or five exams. I had four exams I, I, that I hadn't passed yet. And what happened was that I entered this... Um, I got to a point where I had to meet up with a professor for the last exam that I had failed, and he just told me something that I should have known about myself, that I really, deep down, I knew my whole life, which was that I don't know what I'm doing. I could resonate with everything that had happened in my life, everything, uh, being because I was not sure, I was not aware of what I was doing. I was just this walking zombie, living in denial, um, doing what everybody else wants for me, and have no having no clue why I'm doing what I'm doing and what I'm doing. 
So I was so taken by this. I felt I felt like when I left that room, I felt I'm not going to pass this exam. I'm not going to move forward in my education until I know what I'm doing. I started with this break. I took a break where I was doing a lot of soul searching. And this soul searching break, it was, ex- I'm not going to tell you guys about every detail. It's going to take too long. But it was extended to about two, three years where I got so deeply into it that my my mind was literally worn out. I had gotten so involved in all kinds of personal development books, sermons. I was just searching for answers everywhere else. I was going to my family over and over again for the same questions, asking for the same things, hoping that if I keep asking for the same things, I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to finally get it or, or get an answer that I finally understand properly. Because that's all I knew. That's all I had known is if you don't understand life, you turn to your family. They have the answers. So it was so ingrained in me. I kept going back to them, kept going back to them. And I also looked everywhere else outside my family, um, all these, you know, inspirational speakers and whatnot for answers. So I became this nerd for inspirational speaking and memorized quotes and just being this person that you they would walk around quoting these these um, speakers like Eric Thomas, like Glennon Doyle Melton, um, Diana Nyad, uh, Marie Forleo, all these names that are tied to these things. This is the person I became. Uh, even the Quran became an inspirational book for me. I started looking for verses that would encourage me to fight, to never give up. Uh, I found all these jihad verses. I, I interpreted them as struggle verses that you're supposed to, you know, be persistent, never give up uh, in the name of Allah. And, and didn't understand, didn't understand that it was about jihad. So I uh, started posting these Quranic verses on the walls. Um, I, I just became a mess. And in this entire process of two, three years, I was like a zombie. Time went by. I didn't even notice the days flying by. I didn't do anything. I couldn't do anything. I felt paralyzed. Um, it was difficult just doing a single task a day. So I was definitely depressed. Um, I, I just, I, I started having all these crazy, you know, habits of, of perfectionism, of, you know, I had all these obsessive patterns. Start talking to myself. I became nuts, okay? I became nuts. Um, I took all of these expectations and ideals and standards of this world and I made me so dependent on them and I became a slave to them. And guilt tripping and shaming is exactly what drove me forward in these ways, in these methods. And it's what kept me in this loop that I couldn't get out of. So I got to a point where I begged and I cried and I was just, I had reached the lowest point in my life. I was sleeping, I was going to bed at at, at uh, 9, 10 in the morning and I was up all night being restless, being sad. I was determined to find the answers. You know, this was my goal. I was, I was 100% certain that I was going to be able to help myself. This is a confidence that I've always had since I was a child is that I can solve my own problems. And I think this confidence is a is a result of, of just how I was always overprotected and people got me to think that I can't, you know, live a life without them and function without them and all that stuff. I think this was a revolt against that. I was gonna be the person who saved myself, right? And thank God that is exactly what happened. I found inner strength. I found a way. And that way was actually through God. Because one day I was out walking and I was turning up at the sky and the trees and I was praying to God. I said, God, please, please, God, show me the way. Show me, you know, I I know you have the answer. You have the puzzle piece I've been looking for. Show me the puzzle piece. I need to know what it is. You have the secret. God, I, I am lost. I know there's something missing. You have that answer. God, send me someone, a friend, a boyfriend, anyone. Send me someone. You know, if there's anything that that I need to know that it's difficult to accept, okay? If, 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 if this person, you know, that you send me, if they tell me what I need to hear, what, what, what is true that I don't know of that is difficult to accept, 
do that, you know, send that person because I'm ready. I'm ready to face the difficulty, the difficult stuff. I'm ready to face the uncomfortable stuff. And what happened? A month later, from nowhere, it was a very, I'm not going to tell you guys about the whole detail of it, but just, it was a very coincidental thing. I met this person, we fell in love, and just in a matter of weeks, and months even, I think it was a matter of maybe one, two months, I found out by doing objective research with this person, we would, we would, it started off with him challenging me. He would, he would, um, offend me, he would offend me, he would say things like, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna open your eyes, you don't know what you're doing, but I, I'm telling you, 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 you've got it wrong, and I was like, no, you've got it wrong, you know, I know what I'm doing, I, I know Islam is true, I'm gonna prove to you that, you know, the Quran is just like Christianity, it's just like everything else, and that actually, true Muslims are uh, those who, who believe in Allah, so they believe in God, and they can be any kind of religion. It can be, you know, it can as, as in they can be Jew, uh, Jews, they can be Christians, they can be Muslims. But if they believe in God in the last day, they are Muslims. They that's the, that, that's what they are. You know, I would say that stuff. I would be like, you know, the the Quran talks about how even Jews and Christians go to heaven. Talks well about Christians and Jews. I was on this rampage. I was I was fully defending Islam. All right, and, and this person was not falling for it. Okay, he was not falling for it. Why? Because he knew. He had, he had uh, looked through these different um, belief systems before. He had studied them uh, well enough to understand the differences, the major differences. He brought them up as his argument. I had no way to defend it other than looking into it myself because I didn't know. And he, he was also very, very uh, inf inf informed uh, on history, on just theology in general, politics. This person was informed, okay? God gave me someone who really knew what he was talking about. And and no matter how clever, I mean, trust me, I can say things in such a way sometimes that me, people, when they hear me, they think I know everything, right? It's, it's a, I don't know if it's a gift or a curse because I don't know everything. Um, <laughs> I really don't know everything. But um, I use this gift fully. When I spoke to him, I really tried to get him to think and realize, look, there's nothing wrong with Islam, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. So I brought out my Quran, I told him, look, my Quran is different, it doesn't have footnotes, it's not influenced by the Hadiths, you know? So it's just the Quran alone, and if the Quran alone is not that bad, the way that you, you claim for it to be, you know, you have nothing to say. So I would like, I would bring out the Quran, and I would challenge him, we would read it together, we would go through the verses together. Um, he would form this document, word document of, of arguments as to why I'm wrong. I would form answers to his arguments. And then I just came across this argument about Muhammad. I don't remember in detail what it was, but it was something like, why was it that Islam even had to come down 400 or 500, whatever. I don't remember how many years it was. Was it 700, 400? It had to come down at that point after the Bible, to preach that the Bible was different. You know, what was the argument in that? Why was it that we are relying on the Quran to be true when it's re uh, using the Bible as reference for its teachings and the Bible has more historical, archaeological and theological evidence behind it? Why is it that we're relying on the Quran? It just triggered something in me. It just got me think, okay, how on earth am I gonna, you know, defend this? How am I going to defend this? So I took time. I took time going into it. I was determined I was going to win. And unfortunately, I was not as informed as he was. It turns out I had a lot of problems that I came across in my faith that I did not know of. For example, I did not know that um, Christianity was against Islam, of how they are different in their core teachings. I thought this was a big problem. I mean, come on, if this is the same God, why is he so different? Why is he teaching different things? Um, I didn't see how, you know, I looked at the evidence for, uh, you know, this claim that um, the Bible has been altered, but then I, I see that the Quran is proving that the Bible hasn't been altered, and I see evidence outside the Bible and in the Bible that it hasn't been altered. All these things happened that just opened my eyes. And I started looking at these ex-Muslim videos, I started hearing what are their arguments, I started studying that, it just became this chain reaction. Okay, oh, where, where I, I started accepting this fact that, okay, I am questioning Islam. 
It could mean that I won't be Muslim one day. I don't know yet. Not gonna draw that conclusion, it's too early. But it could be that, could lead to that. So, so I was a bit afraid, okay? I didn't wanna be zapped. I was afraid I would be zapped by Allah. Maybe if I, the moment I leave Islam, for example, he would zap me, who knows? But I thought, okay, never mind. I'll continue. And if God is right in the Quran, if it is the real God of the Bible, I shouldn't discover. There shouldn't be any problems here. I should be able to defend Islam and I should be able to find the answers here to prove that, that my partner is wrong. Oh, I was so wrong. <laughs> I, I realized now, after doing all this research, I came across a verse in the Quran I realized this cannot be from God, and then I burst into tears. I started crying, crying, crying. Um, for like two days, I was in this utter depression. I felt betrayed. I felt, you know, sad. How could God have betrayed me? And and just I realized that at that point, I was believing in a false book. Um, it was not the real God that I believed in. So I was devastated. I was devastated. I didn't know what I was gonna do. And then from there, I thought. It's it's time I, I open the Bible and I you know, and I actually study it properly and see what what the, what God in the Bible is talking about, and so I got into this thing where I started studying. First, I started with the evidence of the Bible, because I needed to know the evidence first before I could even trust opening the Bible. When I when I came across all this evidence, of, of, you know, all kinds of things, I I uh, at last I decided I'm gonna open the Bible. And my partner was like, look, you don't have to rush it, take your time. And I was like, no, I, this is the conclusions I've come to. I need to open the Bible, I need to see what it, what it is. I need to meet this God. So I opened the Bible and I started reading Genesis. I read it, I read it, and I just, as I was reading it, I was shocked. I was like, this is incredible. This is beautiful. This is, this is ama- amazing, you know? Wow, I was just shocked, okay? I, this was unlike anything I'd ever read. And I wasn't sure what's going on inside me, but I felt this overwhelming thing where I, I mean, I already had accepted that, that the Bible was true word of God, but I had not yet accepted Christ. You understand? I hadn't got to that point where I would say, I am Christian. It was, that was just so far in the future. I had never even assumed that that would even happen. So I was just reading it and, and I came across this, there was this verse about whales and mountains and I think it was about whales. Yeah, it was the whale verse. I came across the verse about whales and how magnificent they are. And it just, a thought just hit me from nowhere where just about a year prior to reading this whale verse, I had been obsessed with whales and mountains and things like that. I had looked at whale documentaries and I had seen how how these whales have all these mysterious qualities to them. That people have yet to discover and I was so fascinated by them and then there I was reading the very first chapter of the Bible and God was showing me this these whales it was as if he knew that look Nina you know this is there's the whales that you love it was like he was trying to build an emotional relationship with me it was an it was an emotional contact going on there and when he did this when I saw the whale verse I just I don't know how guys, but at that point I just knew this is God. This is God. It cannot possibly be anything but God. I'd already seen the evidence. I had to accept it. This is God. And and the fact that he was talking about the things I had been obsessed with, it is God. I had seen God in those things. And now he's telling me that he was he's a creator of those things. I just at that point I just knew I was like 100 percent this is it's it's certain now it's certain this is that this is the god of of the universe this is his book and i just was overwhelmed this overwhelming feeling came over me of i can't even explain it i felt cleansed i felt purified my whole world changed everything the way the world looked everything just changed my internal just person I was, the way I thought, everything just at that point, at that moment, it just changed. I transformed and I started crying and crying and crying for just hours. I just pondered, I walked around in my room just crying in total shock. This was God. This was God. I just kept thinking it and I just felt Jesus in that moment. I felt him. I felt his presence. It felt like he was, I felt like God was taking me into his arms 
and comforting me. That that's the feeling I had at that point, and I'll never forget it because it was just life changing. And what happened? Why is this so important? Why is this explaining my story? Because when I accepted God, when I accepted the God of the Bible and the belief, I, I at that point, trust me, guys, I did not yet understand the Trinity. I didn't understand how things were, but I believed in Jesus. I just, I believed, I accepted. I, I just did. It can't be explained. Um, from But from that point and onward, I, I continued with the research stuff that I had already gone through to prove and disprove things. And everything just became clear to me. All my answers started being uh, formed about every question that I had had for all these years about my study problems, about my family problems, everything just became clear. What what I had been praying to God about, the clarity, the wisdom, just the truth, he gave me everything in just a matter of weeks. And I was in this total shock of just getting all this truth given to me through the things that God was teaching me in this experience and in his scriptures. And it was remarkable. It was remarkable. I had my first church visit where people prayed for me the first time. And when I left that visit, my heart felt so warm. It was, it felt like I felt so at ease. I felt so much peace in my heart. And I left that church feeling so much happiness, feeling like I was good enough as I was. I was loved by God. I had always been loved by him. I was good enough as I was. All these feelings, all these things that took on when I accepted Christ and I accepted his new values, the values of of, of the God of the Bible, my whole world changed. Everything I wanted of the world changed. Um, All the problems I had had, the stuff that I said that that I had become insane, everything got, it just slowly but surely got removed. Um, I was cured of these things. I was healed. I was another person. I was happy. I was radi- radiating, you know, of, of, of joy, of life. There were people in my circles who would come up to me, like my aunt and my relatives. They would come up to me and be like, you're a whole different person. What happened to you? They didn't know at the time. It was Christ, you know, but I was like, yeah, it's just, you know, I'm just happier. Um, so the thing is, I kept it secret that I was Christian. I kept it secret that I had left Islam because... Uh, there were a few people I told, very few people I told, who told me, don't tell anyone because, you know, it's going to be pretty ugly. Because you're already in this study difficulty, you know, the last thing you want is to tell them this. They're going to think you're insane. And they're going to just try and stop you and whatever. Don't tell them. Just do it secretly and try and move out of here at some point And just, you know, when, you, when you've moved out, you can live a Christian life. You, nobody has to know. I had already known that the punishment for leaving Islam was was death, so I was aware of this. Um, But uh, here's the thing, though. I kept it secret I was Christian and I left Islam. But my values, the person I was now because I accepted Christ, these values were going to be with me. I wasn't going to be able to change them. And I was still living at home with, with, with my family and that's when the abuse happened in a more intense fashion because my whole life i'd already had these abusive elements i'd i mean two two years prior to having left islam i'd already been in conflict with my parents i'd already told them that you know a lot of the things that had gone wrong in my life that it was the way they had raised me and all that stuff so we'd already been through those conversations and i had already fought a lot of these um abusive aspects, but I was, I had still not really reached the surface. Now I was this new person. I had get, been given strength. I'd been given this fearlessness and courage from the Lord. And I was ready. I was ready to, you know, stand up for my belief systems to do what I needed to do in life. That was true. And that was right. And I was going to do it regardless of what consequences that followed. But I made sure I did it respectfully and I did it with love. All right. So I started this thing where I would take a stand and I would say, I, I want to do this, I want to do that. And if it's not hurting anyone, I don't see the problem of it. I'm, I was still doing the chores and the services and all that of the family, cooking, grocery shopping, whatever. But I I wanted to be alone. I wanted some time for myself to, to I mean, come on, to digest all these things and to 
use these things to solve my problems with my studies. Um, and so it was met with a lot of resistance. They were against this. They were against that, that they were not part of my process, that they didn't know everything. They were against that, that I was turning to them for certain aspects, for certain things that I needed help with, like financially, but not with the other stuff. They felt that I was exploiting them. Um, and, uh, it's, it's funny because, you know, my whole life they had told me that as long as I live under their roof, they were going to support me financially. And they had also told me that um, I didn't need to worry about money. And um, also they were all very well, well off financially. They were, I mean, we're talking about the highest of educations. Um, so, you know, I didn't think money was a problem. But they were starting to have a problem with giving me money when they didn't have control and they didn't have a say in what I was doing. And especially when I was taking so much distance and I was spending time by myself in my room and then I wasn't home a lot of the time. So they started revolting against me. They would start talking bad about me at home. They would walk around saying just awful things like that I'm an idiot. I don't know, all these terrible things that I was, you know, hopefully going to turn th- turn things around and wake up at one point. Um, and... and they were uh, speaking about me. I mean, they were making it very evident. Okay, I heard everything from my room. And I would open the door sometimes. I could hear the things they were saying about me. It was awful stuff. I mean, they were they were taking a hard stand against me. Um, and I understand that I had not done anything. I had not done anything to harm them. I was just living my life through, on my terms. That's all that was taking place. And I was just taking a stand for it and telling them that... This is what I have to do to solve my problems. And if you guys love me, you're going to support me in this. Because this is what I believe is best for me. And you're seeing that there is a positive improvement. You're seeing that I'm feeling better. Everything is running better in my life. Therefore, it must mean that it's working for me. So, uh, please, you know, I I would appreciate if you would respect this. There was no respect about this. Um, (laughs) I was constantly being... um, disturbed they were trying to get into my room they would um, slam doors they would you know you know with yell a lot so it started like that it started with a lot of fighting they were you know trying to to stop me from what i was doing and then came the the punishments the punishments of of just giving me less and less money or or putting me in a situation where i was too deprived financially to be able to do anything um until they put money in in the account. So they were trying to control me that way financially. They would, uh, I don't know if I've already mentioned it, but they were, um, you know, um, always, they were snooping around my room. They would would go in there, look for things, you know, was she doing drugs? What was she doing? They would do all this weird stuff where they try to get as much information from me as possible. So every time I left my room, I had to hide, cover the traces. I mean, this was a full-time job to just protect myself from them, from their um, attacks, you know, verbal attacks, and and their the ways that they tried to scare me in, in how they talked. I I would uh, have to protect myself from them in that sense that always had to cover traces. Every time I left home, I had to bring everything with me. I had to carry heavy, heavy bags to another building, sit there all day. And it was just this constant thing where I would run, a- run away, sit somewhere else, come home late, um, just to avoid all this, this, um, oppression that was taking place. And, um, so slowly but surely I noticed my mother started bullying me. She would, she wouldn't, um, let me speak. She would try to like shut me up, uh, talk over me, um, interrupt me. She wouldn't answer my questions. I noticed my brother would slowly stop talking to me. He, I would approach him I would say hello he wouldn't he wouldn't answer back and then I noticed that he cut contact fully so we would sit at the dinner table and he would just not acknowledge my existence uh, and this kept on going for months I was feeling I'll tell you this guys I felt threatened I felt that I was not safe where we're living in that house where everybody was against me and they were um, punishing me trying to make me you know push me down you know what I mean like make me feel small uh, feel helpless. Uh, if I would 
talk if I would say no, just saying no to something, they would you know just go on this huge rampage, slam doors, stamp on the ground, um, accuse me of just being this disrespectful little weasel of just you know who who have all of a sudden gained the courage to say no to them. It was sick. It was sick. It was twisted. I mean, I, it was the most unhealthy environment I've ever been in, and. And I was all alone in this. I, I turned to my brothers uh, to ask for help. I, I, I had a brother who, who actually would defend me sometimes. He would, when I was there, he would, he would take my side. Um, but he was, he was still afraid. He, he was too afraid to take sides. He was too afraid to support me fully in this. Because he, I, I guess he was also a victim of this stuff. And he, um, which I saw, uh, he was also fighting it. But um, also that he, um, you know, he, he wanted to be politically correct. He wanted to satisfy every part part of this, you know. Um, he didn't want to put himself in any big trouble, I guess. Um, so so he, he would advise me to communicate with him better, to, you know, uh, change my approach and all that stuff. But I would tell him, look, it's not about communication. They are insane. They are trying to, like, destroy me. Because of what I've done, and I haven't done anything other than just trying to live my life. So I would turn to him, and it wouldn't work. And they would like tell me, "Don't tell anyone. Nobody can know about this. This is family matters." And it was just, you know, I try to connect with my cousins. I had some cousins that I reconnected with at that period because I I needed support. I needed to be with people. You know, I felt I felt <laughs> like my life was endangered. So I I needed to be around other people. I needed love. You know, support. So I started befriending the, them, some of my cousins, and and they were like, don't tell them about this stuff, you know, don't tell them anything, and, you know, don't be stupid, and all that. So I felt, I mean, I felt pretty isolated, I felt pretty helpless, and that that uh, anything bad could happen any at any point in time. Especially when I had a fight with, with one of my siblings, uh, who, who was the most violent one, um, and he would tell me that, if I did what I did, what I wanted to do, there was going to be severe consequences socially. And there was no unconditional love. That stuff is only in movies. Like, that stuff doesn't exist. But but there's always conditional love. You can't do whatever you want. There's going to be severe consequences. And I would tell him, of course I can do whatever I want if I haven't done anything wrong, blah, blah. Didn't work. I was just... It was just plummeting. This dynamics at home was plummeting. I was under a lot of pressure. I had to, it just, it led up to that um, they try to force this family intervention. I I said no, I refuse because I know that you guys are just trying to, you're just going to try to force me out of things and force me to think in a certain way. And I refuse to do that. This is not about that we need a family intervention. It's about that you guys need to accept that I have different values. I have a different way of life. That's what this is about. You need to accept that we are different. You need to learn to love me and support me. Even if I don't do things the way you guys hope, hope for me to do or want for me. But if, if I'm doing what makes me happy, what, what's good for me, and what I believe is true, you know what I mean? That's the kind of, of thing I was constantly trying to preach to them. And I, it was very poorly received. Um, they would uh, immediately after that uh, conversation, I had that one with my mom, she would go on a walk with my brother. When we came back, uh, I walked to the fridge and I saw that he had put a post-it notes on probably half of the food in the fridge, maybe even more, of, of things that he had bought for the whole family, but I was not allowed to eat. So now they're trying to starve me, you know, hooray. Uh, so I would walk up to my mom uh, I was in shock when I saw this, and I just looked at her, and she she looked at me, and she was like, well, what do you want me to say? I mean, it's his money. He can do whatever he wants. So I just realized they are all in on this. They want to starve me of, of all these things that they had promised me that I would have as long as I live under the household, which was food, internet, um, you know, uh, money, so that I can, uh, you know, manage my life. And... I was never living a, a way of, of, you know, I was never a brat. I never lived that kind of life where you, you know, you get thousands. I never lived, I always lived a humble life. They were, they could go, go weeks and I would have like, um, maybe $40 in my account. 
Sometimes they gave me, maybe they gave me $80 and I would give like half of that to my brothers. You know what I mean? That's the kind of person I was. Um, so I was shocked by this, these accusations that I was exploiting them and all that. I was the most generous person. I gave my life to these people. I laid my life down for them. Um, any riches I had, I gave to them. Any time that I had, when I was in the middle of all this depression and all this stuff that I went through, I would spend that with them. I would cook for them. I would bake for them. I mean, this is the person that I was. And they had the um, audacity, really, to, to call me a, a selfish person, exploiter, that I was, like, trying to, you know, do, t do things for my own agenda, like, take things that was, you know, suitable for me and leave out the rest. They had no clue. And they were all taking this side. So they were on this um, rampage of starving me, of just making me feel so uncomfortable and unsafe that I would be forced to, um, to you know, put myself out there. Although I was, I, I, I was trying to fix my studies, that was the plan. I was in the middle of university. Yet I was placed in this position where I was not feeling safe enough to live there, not even another month. So I felt I, I have to, you know, work. I have to forget about the studies, you know, I'll have to deal with that later. But I need to work, I need to make money and just move. I need to move out of here. So I was in the middle of this process of just trying to get a job, right? Preparing to get a job. I was running around doing hundreds of errands a day for like a week. I was totally drained and they were like, where are you? Why are you not sitting with us and all that stuff? You know, um, stop avoiding us and all that. I went on to, um, there was one... There were a few weeks where I was able to um, stay over at, at some relative's place so I could get some rest. I mean, I needed recovery after all this stuff. So I went and, and I stayed over at some of my relative's home for about a week. And then I stayed over at my friend's home. I needed to get out of there. And I, I couldn't wait. It was urgent and I was in, in danger. So what happened was that I, I got to a point where there was a, um, where I had to flee, okay? I had to flee home. Why did I have to flee home? Um, because uh, I had decided to um, snuck out of, is that what you say, sneak out of, yeah. I decided to sneak out of home one day uh, because they were preparing for, uh, there's something called Eid. Eid is a celebration of Ramadan. It's the last day of Ramadan where you're supposed to celebrate with all your relatives and whatnot. And I did, as a Christian, with the values that I had, I try to be, you know, as biblically true as possible. I did not want to participate in this Muslim ceremony. Um, it went against my beliefs. So I decided, you know what, I'm not going to participate, but I can't tell them because then they're going to wonder why. Then I would have to tell them I'm Christian. That wouldn't be safe. So I, I said to myself, I'm going to just sneak out. And just be outside the way I'm always outside hiding. And um, and just be there and then come back home later. So I did that. And when I came back home, I was met with awful, awful threatening text messages of that. They were going to start punishing me and treating me like a teenager because I was acting like a teenager. So they were going to... I, um, I was going to be surprised with the things that they were going to do to me. Uh... They were no longer going to support me financially, so I would have to, you know, turn somewhere else for money. They um, they regretted everything good that they've done to me. You know, I when I saw that those messages, I thought this is serious. I cannot stay here another day. Not only do I have a brother who's probably so angry at me right now. I mean, he hasn't spoken to me for like months. The last the the, the the last thing I want is to come home to these to the people who have this mentality, who have made these decisions, and a brother who's already upset with me. I mean, who knows? <laughs> Seriously, who knows what this can lead to? So I felt immediately, I need to go. I need to flee. So I started packing my stuff, and I decided tomorrow morning, I'm going to you know pack, finish the packing, and I'm going to flee. So I did that. I packed everything, threw everything in the bag, and um, I couldn't flee to any relatives because you guys know uh, in these cultures and religions, uh, they're all working together. So you can't. Uh, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to 
flee to someone else. I had no nobody else to live at at that point in time besides my partner. So I fled to my partner. I had to carry a heavy bag. I finally got to safety. I finally got away from that awful abusive home. Uh, and I got to stay at his place and recover. And while I was there, they would attack me from a distance. They would try to guilt me, guilt trip me and shame me. All my relatives got involved. How can you do this to your mother? You know, stuff like that. She's crying. She's coming to us crying. And everybody t- took my mother's side. Every Nobody cared about, you know, what could possibly have happened in this household. No. In, the, in these cultures, you are alone. Okay, that's how it works. If you're abused, if you're taking a stand against it, your whole family is going to turn against you. And if you flee, they're going to make you look like uh, you're the, the crazy one. Uh, so that's what happened. Um, and then I realized, okay, you know what? That they, I'm never going to be safe. I'm never going to be able to practice this stuff. Live the life I want to live uh, in full freedom without constantly having interventions with them. I'm not going to be able to be free. I'm not going to be able to be loved and accepted and respected as I am. It's not going to happen. So I thought, you know what? I'm just going to I'm just going to tell my dad who I am and and everything that happened over the last, I don't know, 10 months or so. So I told him everything in a text message. Wrote everything to him. And I was like, I, you know, hoping really badly like God, please, please God. Um let's I I pray that he is different, that he's going to understand me. I was wrong. I was wrong. He didn't understand anything. And as a matter of fact, he just thought I was insane. I had used Islam and Christianity as some kind of excuse not to study all these weird accusations and he thought it was a phase and whatnot. And I just, when I read these things, I realized, okay, nothing's going to change. Until they change their values, nothing's going to change. And I, I might as well live the life that I've wanted to live for so long, that I've been fighting since I was 17, which is to be free. I'm going to go on Facebook I'm going to post myself as in a relationship and that I am now a Christian because I am free. I th- What are they going to do? Are they going to punish me? I, I fled home. I fled home. They, they can't remove money from me. They can't throw me out of the house. So, so what are they going to do? So I thought, okay, I, I'll come out with it. And if there's any bad re- response from other relatives and whatnot, they're going to defend me because now they're going to be happy. They're going to see the, who I really am. They're going to understand that uh, that th- this was just a matter of, of that I was afraid to come out of the closet. Um, and hopefully when they see this, they're going to under- understand and take my side. So I came out on Facebook and I posted these things. And um, well, guess what? I was uh, harassed and I was uh, attacked by these people, my own, my very own family, relatives. I received hundreds and hundreds of messages and missed calls of, of um, take down the things from, from Facebook, take everything down and, and you know, they're gonna kill us, you're, 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 gonna, you're gonna get us all killed, they're gonna come af- after you and kill you, you know, all these Muslims that we know, you know, they, they, are, they are extremists, they, they, they're not gonna let you live after this, so, so um, and I received lots of messages like, you know, how could you have betrayed us, how could you have done this to us and all that stuff, so I realized, okay, they feel like I have betrayed them. They're taking the sides of these extremists by um, um, showing everyone, because they did that on Facebook, uh, showing everyone that they have no idea what's going on, they, they are not part of it. So they're indirectly handing me over to the enemy, that's what they're doing, um, by not pr- uh, defending me. Um, and they, they just try to force me and you know beg me a lot of the times try to beg me to to take everything down and, and um, pretend that it was my my account was hacked they they try to make it seem like it was all just fake and um i refused i stood my ground i kept everything up on facebook i thought i have not done anything wrong why should i be threatened because i am christian why should i be threatened because i'm in a relationship with someone just because he's westerner i have to be in, in trouble or because my I, my parents didn't know until a few days ago, then then I'm not allowed to. All these rules, I decided, you know what? No, forget about them. Forget about them. I know I have not done anything wrong. By being myself, this has been a frustration. I've wanted to come out for so long with my values. 
finally I get to do so, I'm going to stay my stand my ground, you know? So it was very poorly re uh, received by, you know, every relative got involved. They tried to convince me to talk, talk it out with my family. They have no idea how much I've been talking to them for months and months. They wouldn't listen. Uh, th and they have no idea what they did to me at home. How every single day I had to flee to another building to feel safe. How I had to avoid eating. So I had to wait for them to eat before I could eat. How I had to skip breakfast every single day for like a few months. Just so I can have time enough to run out. They have no idea what I've been through. And, and everybody got involved. They got involved. They were like, you don't know what's happening. But, you know... Everybody has been through what you've been through. You know, it's a family thing. It's it's a it's a cultural thing. You've just misunderstood it. You've took it too far. You've exaggerated. Um, it's not as bad as it seems. Nobody's gonna kill you. Come back. Come back. You know, we or we, we want to meet you. You know, they try to arrange meetings with me. They wanted me to to meet them. So so they were like, let us come meet you. You know, your mother can come. She can bring bring your stuff. All the stuff that you left behind at home, she can bring it with you, with her. You need warm clothes. It's winter. Um, they were really trying to. Also, on top of all this, they were trying to um, just push this thing that I have to be diplomatic. I have to. I can't do whatever I want. Um, all that stuff. I don't remember it in detail right now because, again, it's my memory glitch. They try to do all these things to me. I stood my ground. I refused to, and and I realized I could not. I, I could not keep contact with them, because not only was my life in danger now. Having them in my life, people would find out where I am. People would find out everything about me if if I was in contact with them. So I needed to be away from them. I needed to be safe. So uh, and also I could no longer take the abuse. I mean, they were abusing me at a distance. I mean, come on. They were sending things to me, abusive messages at a distance, even. Even as I was free, I was not free. So I was, I was like, forget this. They're all part of this. They're all part of this agenda that you have to be in a certain way. If you don't, you can't have the love of the family. So I thought, okay, I will be in that certain way. And if that means that I have to worry about my life, if that means I can no longer have the love and support of my family, well, you know what? Maybe that love and that support was not true and genuine and not of God in the first place. You know, maybe maybe that is the problem. Maybe the, the problem here is that keeping them in my life is not a good idea. If that is the rules that they live by, if that is the rules that all of my relatives support and live by the way that they took their side the way that they went against me even those who had you know similar lifestyles or or attitudes as me would speak against me against what i had done so i was the way i looked at it was look they, they are all traitors they betrayed me the whole bunch betrayed me um and until they change the way they think i'm not gonna have any contact with them um and ever since then, they've really been trying to get in contact with me. They've tried to, you know, in many ways, lure me back to the, under their control. They've they've tried to make me return money that they gave me. They have tried to take my computer back, uh, which they gave me. I was given this computer. It was my mom's. She gave it to me when she bought herself a tablet. Uh, but And that happened many months ago. And I have lots of, you know... I've had this computer for a while, but but they really try to um, make it seem as if I've taken it, doing everything really they can to bring me down, because it's they're not going to want me to be happy. They're not going to want me to be free and live a life and you know do things I want to do and and have things become better now that I'm away from them. Because what a what a horrible thing for them, for their honor, for everything that that they have defended so so badly. How, how embarrassing for them that 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 one girl uh, who 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 they thought was the last person to ever revolt against them because of how brainwashed and and weak-minded I was would do such a thing. 
I mean, it's it's a it's a huge insult. It has nothing to do with love. It has nothing to do with, it's with freedom or with with what's best for you. And it, it's an insult to them that I'm living a good life now, uh, away from them, away from their financial control, away from their physical control. And so they're going to do everything they can to to bring me down to make my life a living hell. But the the thing is, unfortunately for them, I did not do anything wrong. But in any case, I rely on the Lord. I know he will protect me because God knows more than anyone else that I did this truthfully. I did this uh, respectfully. I did this spot free. Okay, so, so, so I know that God has my back. Because, you know, how are you going to turn someone innocent into, you know, make, try, ha- trying to make them look like a villain? And I really have not had any will or intention to harm them in this process i just i just wanted to be free guys i just wanted to be left alone but they're not leaving me alone they're they're really trying hard so you know what if that's what they want then they can do that but i i'm gonna rely on the lord and the fact that i have not wronged them i don't take words seriously i take action seriously and i and i've seen how they have acted behind closed doors to me like animals, they treated me like I was an animal, and I have, there was no unconditional love, there was no true support, and there was love and support as long as you did things their way, Uh, that's what it was, and and now that I am finally free, and and I can live that life that I've wanted, they will not let me, and they will try and do everything they can not to, to let me, because they love me that much, you know. So, so that is overall uh, the story. Uh, there are so many elements I have not mentioned here. So many things that that they did that that I did not mention that I just don't remember right now because of the memory glitch. So, so these are people who who supposedly love you, who are supposedly followers of the true God, yet they have used Islamic values. They have used cultural values uh, of abuse against me and uh, I know the the God of the Bible and I know that he does not tolerate and accept and command such behavior so I know that they are not of him Uh, and I pray that they will be one day but for now I want nothing to do with them they they're all a bunch of betrayers and uh, they they to this day have not understood what true love is and they will do everything they can to destroy my life in these cultures guys you need to understand this nobody takes the side of the abused it's always the abused person's fault the fact of the matter is they thought i was brainwashed because they were brainwashed because they brainwash so they think that anyone who who believes differently than them is brainwashed I have made it this far because I am strong on my own, because I have won over all of the insecurities and the weaknesses and the fears that I that I dealt with at the time living under their control. I have in that sense um, become victorious and I have rejoiced in this chaos and in this misery because all of this is a sign to me of what kind of person that I really was all this time under the surface I I was capable of doing these things but in these cultures you never know the danger of it you never know how abusive they are you never know the, the, the evil aspects of Islam until you take a stand against it that's the rule because I took a stand against it my life became a living hell. So now you guys know. Um, thank you guys for, for listening to this. And I hope you have a better understanding of what took place. Uh, hopefully, eventually, I will be able to explain these things better. And it won't take as long as it does now.